Number 14, Uncle Ralph. A visit to the insane asylum. Yeah. Well, that was an eye-opener. Before Sarah Lamb did it for the movie, I visited Elgin. Elgin, Illinois is 20 miles out of Chicago. You drive there, it was like 95, and then we did it five years ago, four, or three years ago for the movie. Both cases, it's now a mental health facility. So loving, so kind, you know, don't worry, we're all schizophrenic. There have to be two, and everybody's got mental problems. So I ask if I can speak to the highest administrator there. So now I'm in the head of personnel, a sweet lady, in a big office with a desk. She's around in her 30s. I have a box of soap and articles, and I'll never forget this. As anyone knows, in two minutes I'm a born talker, so I don't even wait till I sit down. I'm crossing to her big desk with the box, and I say... I want to tell you about my father, Dr. Brenner, who was committed here in 1947, and it was like I'd hit her in the stomach. She actually gasped and said, Oh my God, forced labor, yes. Electric shock, yes. Luckily, I could say no to lobotomy. What impressed me was they knew themselves what a terrible history they had been. In fact, until 1951, it was called the Elgin Insane Asylum. Now, keep in mind, he escaped in 47. I taught 32 years. One of my favorite authors was Edgar Allan Poe. I sort of thought that the word insane asylum had died out with Poe. Picture as late as 51 that you have a depressed aunt and you've got to put her in the insane asylum. Who wants to visit an insane asylum? By the time I was finished with the story and the articles... She was crying and said, I'll never hear another story like this in my life. Wow. Yeah, that she knew what had happened and that I could say no to a lobotomy. Right, right. How did, how did Grandpa get out? Remember, I, I, you just saw it yesterday. That makes me feel good because my memory goes back and forth. Dr. Lacey has taken him out on a nice Sunday she goes to the bathroom, he takes $20 out of her purse. Then he runs out of the restaurant, finds a paper, wanted ride. I, as I said in, the, in that, that clip, I wish it was a more dramatic story, like I helped him over the wall. See, it was a paradox there. The insane asylum also had cherry orchards. They had outdoor picnics. They had music once in a while. But does that make up for electric shock, insulin shock? The forced labor one is sticky, and that shows up good in um, Sarah Lamb's movie because Dad loved hand labor. Now, the difference between hand labor and forced labor. Uh, hand labor is where you're doing it on purpose, building a concrete wall or something. Uh, excuse me, by choice. Forced labor seems to be against your will. But it, it is positive. But uh, on a nice Sunday, he simply took the $20 and ended up with that, making it to Los Angeles. And here's an interesting part of the whole Brunner story. I don't think I've ever put it this way to my family. If he hadn't had to escape from the insane asylum, there had, might never have been a Dr. Brunner soap or company. He was making his living as a consultant. He was not making soap, and he was sort of satisfied with that. Why he had to make soap on his own is he's in Los Angeles with a resume that nobody in his right mind would hire. Where were you last week in an insane asylum? <laughs> so he had to think of a way of making money on his own, and that's where he started. Now, it's going to surprise people. He actually knew how to make soap and made limited amount for friends, but his first commercial product was Dr. Brenner's mineral, bullion, uh, mineral salt and then mineral bullion. Which is astounding because in the Brenner family, there is no history of food products at all. We go back to the 1850s in Heilbronn, Germany as soap boilers. So where Dad got into mineral salt, it was just starting with Gaylord Hauser, Dr. Jenkins, and other so-called crackpots that were breaking into the health movement. That's a good aside though, right? Yeah. Uh, that he would not have made soap 
and there would be no business if he had Could you could you uh, tell the story from the time that he left? Is it Louisa who took him to Love Sunday? Because there's the punchline of, you know, he's. Oh yeah, if you want, and, yeah, you can edit this together in yeah. there. So one of my favorite parts of his story to the escaping to Los Angeles is he actually found an ad where somebody wrote wanted share ride Los Angeles. So he calls the guy up and they get together and it went so well on the third day. This is the old days. No super highways. They're in Vegas. Got to make a pit stop and fill up with gas when he really thought this would win the guy over, says, this ride's been great. Would you believe I just escaped from an insane asylum? <laughs> so when Dad went in to go to the bathroom and came out, there was no car waiting for him. <laughs> but that's when he used one of his favorite stories, and my son Mark still argues with me about this. He makes it to a casino. They aren't far uh, apart out in the Vegas area. And he always had this thing about roulette, because roulette's big in Europe too. There's only two choices, red or black, forget the numbers. He would wait until one of the colors came up six times. He told me, six times in a row, you sometimes have to wait half an hour, because it'll do two, then do the black, and then one, 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 now three in that. But the odds of it becoming six in a row, statistically, is pretty tough, even though my son in calculus reminds me that the... The wheel doesn't know and have a brain, but statistically, it's pretty hard to do. And when it was six times red, you bet on the black. And he came away with $400. We're talking in 47, 48. So that's a tremendous amount of money. And uh, I tried it in Vegas. And it was, I even waited one more. I got seven blacks and bet on the red. And green came up. I didn't even know there was green. Green is the house. So what, exactly what happened when he got to L.A.? Because I'm still a little hazy on that. He... Well, that's a good question, Michael. When he gets to L.A., keep in mind that he knows no one. He picked L.A. because he had escaped twice in the Chicago area. That was only 20 miles from Elgin. Elgin, he connected with old friends. So the insane asylum could find him pretty easy. It's a little hazy for me, too. He didn't do anything for a while. He did have the $400, but then that ran out, and he, he loved to brag that he slept on the roof of the YMCA with the pigeons, penniless and poor. So he must have blown the 400 somewhere. It was cheap in those days. I remember coming out there in the early 50s, we eat at Clifton's for 50 cents, a buffet kind of place. But he slowly became, no, not even slowly, he became a speaker, and probably pretty quick. There's still postcards where you could hear him speak at the Embassy Hotel, 1948. It gives a date and so on. Then he linked into people that were followers of his movement and so on. But you have a really good question on what was he living on until he started making the mineral salt. And that, that period is sort of filled with him speaking and then tying in with really oddball people. Because you were considered a crackpot in the late 40s and 50s with anything advocating health, one world, that we're all children of God, you are really crazy on those things.